Um, thanks. Um, as she said, I'm Manish. I'm the founder of DGraph. Um, Ten years actually is a pretty long time, and uh, uh, the, my first impression of Singapore after visiting after 10 years has been the Singapore skyline has changed very considerably, but the price of roti prata in a local uh, food court is still the same, adjusting for inflation. <laughs> and for that, I'm glad. Say hello to our mascot, Diggy. He's a badger. Um, why a badger? Uh, because they like to dig, and at DGraph, we like to dig data. <laughs> Before I jump into DGraph, let's talk about graph databases. <laughs> so what are graph databases? Graph databases are databases optimized for handling graph data. In addition to property lookups common with both relational and key value stores, graph data frequently requires users to traverse relationships, also known as joins. Hence, graph databases optimize for both lookups and edge traversal. Doing joins is a first-class citizen action for graph databases. So they're optimized for key value lookups and for edge traversals. What is DGraph? DGraph is an open source graph database built for web scale production environment written entirely in Go. It's fast, it is sharded and distributed, and by distributed we do, we, ta we tackle the challenges of distributed joins, which is a very tough one. Um, we do distributed filters and distributed sorts. It's horizontally scalable. Um, we do consistent replication via raft. And it's highly available by design. That means there is no single point of failure. And there is automatic read failover in case of server crashes. And it is also fault tolerant. It can handle server losses without affecting queries. The system can even be partially available for uh, for subset of data. So why build it? Graph technology is hidden, but it's everywhere. <coughs> Any company doing anything smart is using graphs. But there is no native scalable solution. Existing graphs are either single server architecture like Neo4j, or they are hastily put together graph layers on top of a proper database like Kaylee, Titan DB, or DSE graph. With no existing standard, companies have to build their own graph systems. For example, Facebook has Facebook DAO, Google has Knowledge Graph, Twitter has FlockDB, and Dropbox, Pinterest, LinkedIn, and numerous others have their own versions of graph layers. Therefore, we're building DGraph with the aim to provide a fast and horizontally scalable graph database, which can work for large and small companies alike. So what does graph data look like? We have two kinds of edges. One pointing from a node to another node. If you remember computer science, you will remember two circles and one edge between the two circles. That's node to another node. And second point from a node to a value. Some people think of it as attributes attached to a node. For example, we have facts. Singapore is a neighbor of Malaysia. Here, both Singapore and Malaysia are nodes in the graph. And Singapore is a neighbor of Indonesia. And then there are half facts like Singapore's national drink is Milo. It kind of is, <laughs> just not officially. <coughs> and then we have the values. For example, Singapore name is quotes string Singapore. <coughs> Since we released the version 0 0.1 in December 2015, uh, we have uh, gained 3,200 GitHub stars. Uh, we have 32 contributors. Um, the next release will be version 0 0.8. And we have been on the front page of Hacker News multiple times. So quickly, just going through benchmarks, DGraph is 100 times faster than Neo4j in terms of data loading, and three to six times faster in terms of read-write workload. It's 9.7 times faster um, than Kaylee in terms of loading data, and five to 37 times faster in terms of querying data. There's a link to the benchmark code if you want to independently verify these things. The idea behind showing you the benchmarks was to convince you that DGraph is fast. Now that I've convinced you that DGraph is blazingly fast, let me address the elephant in the room. Should you really be using a graph database? Let's, let's tackle some of the myths first. Are they an overkill? I might have to run some traversals. Should I use graphs, or is it an overkill? Are they robust? Do I need to run a primary data store so that this graph database does not lose my data? 
Are they scalable? I have to run a lot of queries. Can graph database achieve performance and scale? And the answer is no, yes, yes. You should use graph database. They're not an overkill. They are robust. They can act like your primary data store. And they will scale. In fact, data with a sharded and distributed architecture will scale better than a MySQL uh, database stuck on a single server. Now that we have negated some of the myths associated with graph databases, let's talk about SQL. This is a bold statement to make, but I'll make it. Your SQL database is slowing you down. SQL is like C, and graph query languages is like Go or Python. Just like higher level languages allow you to express your logic faster, databases allowing more complex queries and more flexible schemas allow you to iterate on your application faster. They achieve this by cutting down your application code by at least half. I would say more. So what SQL forces you to do? Because SQL does lesser things, you need to do more things. You need to maintain a strict schema. If you modify even a column data type from in to float, you'll have to do a manual table migration in SQL. There, you will do data duplication to avoid slow joins. The same information needs to be kept in multiple tables so that the queries on that table can perform well and does not read required join. Finally, you'll have to pre-compute counts for foreign tables to allow efficient sorting. Joins are expensive, and it's better to count comments, upwards, etc., in advance to allow sorting on them in using just one table. What does dgraph do? dgraph supports flexible sparse schema with real-time modifiable data types. You can set a predicate data type from int to string, to float, to timestamp, as you deem fit, while iterating over your application and with the data already present in dgraph. You don't need to migrate. Um, nothing has to happen. You just send a small command. Join a single lookup away, so there's no need for a data uh, duplication, with, which, which significantly simplifies your schema. And any counts can be done in real time. Moreover, any sorts can be done on these counts efficiently. Finally, I'll show you a demo. Uh, we'll run this demo on Stack Overflow data. Stack Overflow, as you all know, right? <laughs> it's a medium complexity system with questions, answers, upvotes, search, newsfeed, etc. And it's a great example of a typical web application that I would say maybe 90% of startups build. First, we'll compare its schema in SQL to its potential schema in dgraph. This is how the user looks like in their schema. This is the data dump that we did. Um, it has some, inform uh, some important information like reputation, creation date, display name, etc. But then it also has views and upvotes and downvotes. And they don't really belong here. They belong to a different table that they have. It's called a votes table. So this is its duplicate info to, 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 to provide a workaround in SQL because it doesn't do joins well. Then we have versioning. Every time you edit a question, edit an answer, um, they store a version. For that, we keep everything the same. They have a post ID in their table, and for us, we just point to a post using an edge. This is the table which is the most complex table that they have, which is the actual post table. It has a type. The type is question or answer. It has a parent ID, which you won't understand what it is. But in Degra, what we did was we changed that to has answer. So question, has answer, answer. Similarly, they had accepted answer ID. We changed that from question, um, chosen answer, answer. It immediately makes sense. Then they did something really interesting. Instead of having the data in versions, they copied some data into the user table, the title, the body, the tags. These are frequently queried data. Um, so they, they duplicated to a wider join. For us, we just pointed to a version. And then they have a whole bunch of extra fields like last editor user ID, last edit date, last activity date, comment count, answer count, favorite count, creation date. All of these need to be maintained in application code every time some activity happens on the website. 
and it's a duplicate information to avoid joins again. Finally, look at this very carefully. They have comments in the vote table, and they have a post ID to represent which post um, it points to. But think about it in our mental map. When we think of a post, uh, sorry, a comment, you don't think of a comment as containing a post. The comment belongs to the post, not the other way around. And yet, we have been doing this for years, where we'll create a separate table and then point it back to the post. That's very unnatural, and that's a hack that everybody's taught in college. What we do is we just create a simple edge from post to, to vote or comment, because that's the direction that you would always traverse. When you want a post, you also want the comments on the post, you want the votes on the post, so it's just natural. So in a sense, this is what the, the schema looks like. It's a lot simplified. We have a post. The post has an answer, which is another post, uh, answer post. Has a chosen answer, another post. Has a vote, which has a score and the author. Comment has a text and author. And then they have versions. And each version is essentially one edit uh, in, the, in the website. So we have three edges coming out. We have tags the body and the title. All right. So I'll do a, a live demo here. I'll show you two queries to generate two pages of Stack Overflow. The first is the top questions, the top interesting questions. If you look carefully, they are sorted by timestamp. It contains the author of that question, the, 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 uh, the tags, the title, and some other counts. So this is what we do here in dgraph. Can you guys see this or should I? Is this better? People in the back, can they see this? All right. So we are looking for the top 25 questions uh, in descending order of timestamp, right? So we look for equality type question. We look at the view count. View count is stored. But then we do a count of has answer in real time. We do a count of vote. We get the owner. We get its display name and reputation. We don't need to store the display name in the post table. We actually literally do to an edge. Then we have a title, we get the text and the timestamp. This is the version. We have tags, we get the text, and finally a timestamp. And let me run that. So if you look carefully, just look at just this one of one, one of this, and the rest is just like a copy. So you have the owner with the display name Pete with reputation of 11. <coughs> you found the tags. You did a join over here. You found the timestamp. You found the title. You found the view count. You found the count of answers and the count of vote. All right? And this is basically repeated 25 times. And it's a single query to generate this entire tab. Just think about how, how powerful that is. Secondly, we have a questions page. This question page is a bit more complex, <coughs> right? <laughs> I don't think anybody in this room has ever browsed this question. <laughs> That's right. <laughs> of course. So we have the title of the question. Then we have the body of the question. We have um, some of the votes. We have the editor. We have the, author, the original author. We have the comments. And look at these comments. They actually sorted by something. Then we have the eight answers, and they show like a couple of answers. All right. Let's look at the query for this. Now this is a bit more bigger query, and I'll just like kind of browse through it. Don't try to understand the entire query. It's a new query language, so you might not be able to get it immediately. But it's based upon GraphQL, so it's very intuitive. So we first we do, we just need to get some questions. So what I'll do is I just get the top question um, by score. Then I get the total votes on that question and the total votes on each answer. So we get the vote, we get the score, we, we count the, the number of votes. Then for each of them, we sum the votes in the answer. Then we retrieve the question. We get the title, text, author, display name. We get the total votes and views. All right. Then we get the latest five comments are ordered by timestamp, and also account for these comments. Then we have the top five answers. They are ordered by votes. And if you look at this variable, this was actually generated in another block before this. Let me just jump back quickly. Um, so we had this A votes over here. We generated this on the fly. And now we are using that to, to do a descending order sorting 
using this variable that we generated. Okay. So we get the, the top five answers ordered by votes, and then we just get the latest comments on those answers. For this, I think it's better to show in this UI that we built. All right, let me just, um, yeah. Okay, let's start from this thing. We have the question, we have the title of the question, how can I keep my cat off my keyboard? <laughs> That's useful. We have the view count. We have the count of the comments. We have the count of answers that it has. And we have the number of votes. Okay. Now, now we, we look at the votes, we look at the comments on this question. We get the display name, we get the text, um, we also get control or laser pointer, which is, I think, the best advice here. So these are like the top five answers sorted by timestamp. If you look at the timestamps carefully, you will notice that they are decreasing order. Okay, so let me remove this. And then let's look at has answer. So we have the answers, and if you look at um, the, we have the body of the answer, we have the comment on the answers, and we have the, the number of votes on the answers, this is 192 votes, all right? And this is the body is another answer that we have, and this one actually has 71. So if you keep on going down, you will notice that they are in decreasing order of the number of votes, right? And this is enough information, it goes down pretty long, this is enough information to render an entire page here. Just think about how complex these pages are. Um, I worked in, in, in Quora for a bit. I remember they had thousands of components to generate a page like this. And we can do that in a single query um, in dgraph. So that takes away a lot of complexity from your code. OK, final thoughts. So when to use dgraph and when SQL? SQL has a great use case, which is to provide acid transactions. It's a great solution to, to store financial data. If I was uh, storing my bank balance, I'll probably use SQL. But for everything else, there's MasterCard, sorry. <laughs> <laughs> for everything else, I think there's a well-designed graph database, which is more ideally suited because it cuts down the amount of coding effort required using the power of graphs to run complex queries so you don't have to. Thank you. Any questions? Yes. So uh, I know you It will be integrated. Uh, when we do a point eight release, it would be with Badger. So, in fact, I think in Master we already have a PR to integrate Badger. We just solved the last um, issues, um, and then this will be part of it. Yeah. Oh yeah, I wanted to a uh, shameless plug about Badger. If you need a key value store, um, you should check out Badger. It's pretty fast. Another question. How many people understood what I was talking about? Um, let's ask this guy. Uh, just a quick question. Uh, sorry, is my working? Uh, just a quick question. Uh, does dgraph have any uh, facility for enforcing like uh, constraints or uh, referential integrity? Constraints or integrity? Uh, uh, sorry, constraints or referential integrity. Uh, honestly, I don't know what referential integrity means. Oh, okay. um, but um, we actually have schema. Um, and you can set the schema. For example, you can set something to be of type int. And if we then receive something which cannot be parsed as an int, it would um, um, error up. Yeah. Uh, going one, going two. No questions. All right. Thanks a lot. Thank you.